okay. See, accountants, accounting firms, we're not all boring, do <laughs> The reality is you spend more time with your team than, than with your family. We, we all work towards the same goal. We all know why we're here and why we do it, and, and we all love what we do. I like to say we work side by side with our clients. We like to sit on the same side of the table as them. To me, making business personal is literally what our clients are about. A lot of them are family owned and family operated businesses, and to them, their business is personal. So we just need to show that we care. Being by their side on their journey, I guess, as they create and enhance value for their business, it's making sure that I'm really there as, as a friend, but in a professional way. One of the more important things is having a really deep understanding of what your clients actually need as opposed to what they want. One of the things I love most about my role is that I actually get to work with so many other people in the firm. To me, I truly believe that um, our client success is our success as well and that's why we get out of bed in the morning. At Picture Partners, we're making business personal. We're making business personal. We're making business personal. We're making business personal. Cut. <laughs>
So it just goes to show that the mid-market does punch above its weight. But I guess more than the metrics, we are talking about private businesses and individuals who are investing their own money. And when we look at the characteristics of many mid-market business owners, and I am going into a bit of generalisations here, John, but we are talking about people who are self-motivated and self-driven, they're ambitious, they're active, they do have a strong self-belief, and they tend to have a growth mindset. Gavin, can you tell us a little bit about the report and what the research targeted? Well, as you know, John, we work with middle market businesses every day. So we do have a deep understanding of the challenges that they're facing and the opportunities that they're focusing on. But we did want to undertake some independent research to test our thinking, but also to get a broader view of the market. In order to do this, we engaged the services of consultancy firm Forethought and went out and interviewed 400 business owners across different life cycle stages in Australia's middle market. Our focus, importantly here, was not on the financial metrics of these businesses. We wanted to really understand what makes these businesses tick, what issues are keeping the business owners awake at night, and what opportunities are they seeing and focusing on. Many of the findings that did come out were as expected, but there were a few surprises that came out as well. Now, obviously, a lot has changed in the world since you completed the research for the report. We had the devastating drought across New South Wales, a harsh bushfire season, and the COVID-19 pandemic have all impacted business in, in big ways. How have these events been factored into the report and the findings? Uh, yes, that's a, a great question, John. First of all, I'd like to say that the findings within our research uh, do still remain relevant. In April, we did undertake some further research. Uh, this was at the height of Australia's and the globe's reaction to the COVID-19 pandemic. This research showed significant impact to Australia's mid-market businesses, with almost every industry feeling the effects. I've got some sobering statistics that came out of that research to share with you too, John. Out of the 400 responses from business owners, 40% said their business had reduced their workforce due to the pandemic, with the average reduction rate being 26%. As expected, the hospitality, tourism and travel industries were the worst hit amongst respondents, with a 44% reduction to their workforces. And retail followed a similar vein with a 30% reduction in their workforces. So you can see that these events, in particular the COVID-19 pandemic, has had a serious negative impact to many businesses and many individuals in Australia. Before we wrap up, my final question to Gavin is, what should businesses have their eye on for the year ahead? A few key things stand out, John. The first would be to be prepared. Recent events have shown that the unexpected can happen. So it's important for businesses to build in a bit of a safety net, cash flow buffer, some headroom in some debt facilities, and maybe some new sources of equity being available. And in addition to that, it's also important to build in some flexibility. As customer demands for your products and services change, you need to make sure that your business can adapt its operations and business model to continue to meet those demands. The second area would be to be aware. It was quite clear in the research that mid-market operators had their focus firmly fixed on local and industry-specific matters. And whilst domestic and international events may not directly be impacting your business in the short term. Over time, there will be some trickle-down effects and you'll find that your industry, your business and even your customers could be impacted in some way, shape or form from those events. This awareness doesn't need to be an intense endeavour. You know, it's about having a few key reliable sources of information that you can go to to build this awareness and to continue to keep that awareness up to date with current events. And the third item would be to be strategic. Recent events have given businesses the opportunity to reflect and to rethink their strategy. And in doing this, it is important to remember that more heads are better than one. So if you are feeling professionally isolated, I do encourage you to invest the time to build your professional and business networks and then to engage with those networks start having those key strategic conversations with them and help broaden your thinking around those key areas of your business that you need to focus on.
I would like to now welcome Andrew Beats. Andrew, thanks for joining me. And could you take us through some of the findings of the report that you found interesting? Yeah, thanks for having me, John. There are a number of aspects which we really jumped out of us when we were going through the data. Uh, firstly, from a family business perspective, managing the dynamics between the family employees and non-family employees is a common strain amongst most family-owned businesses. Also, the next aspect came from the research was that business owners don't normally consider themselves innovators, but a lot of them have created and developed solutions that could be commercialised. You don't need to be a tech giant to be considered innovative. Also, the importance of a sounding board shouldn't be underestimated, whether it's a structured advisory board or through an informal networking, they all seem to work and that they should be relied on. Another aspect was that the middle market business have in-depth knowledge of the micro events within their industries and how it may impact their businesses, but don't focus much on the macro. Recent events such as bushfires, droughts and the coronavirus demonstrate the importance of being aware of and planning of how you respond to the macro environment. And the last thing that surprised me the most is that over 33% of respondents didn't have a succession plan in place. People just get stuck in the day-to-day -day running of the business and miss the chance to be opportunity ready. The Picture Partners Business Radar Report showed that the top three main motivators for starting a business are work-life balance, following a passion, and to have control over my own destiny. Is this what you're finding? And do you think that these factors will remain the top motivators into the future? Yeah, that's a great question, John. Um, in my 25 years of providing advice to clients, the goalpost has definitely changed. We've seen more of an emphasis on work-life balance gradually creep into the psyche of business owners. The shift seems to lead them to be more passionate within their businesses and on their external business endeavours, which may be why these factors are top of mind for most businesses today. In the future, we think that these factors will be more prevalent in the workplace and the traditional office will be replaced with a more distributed workforce that chooses where and when they work. We believe that discussions around work-life balance will not be an issue going forward as people, that is business owners and employees, will choose their own unique balance under this model. Now, looking at mid-market business and their growth cycle, what do you think some of the challenges and opportunities uh, will be? Well, in short, John, the question can be broken down into four main areas. Firstly, before embarking on new opportunities for growth, businesses and business owners need to take a step back. Don't run before you walk. Secondly, be aware that steady growth can be a precursor to complacency. Thirdly, constantly look ahead. Make sure that you can see around the corner and anticipate your next move. And lastly, contingency plans should be part of a mid-market business plan. Andrew, you touched on micro and macro environments earlier. Now, recent events demonstrate how important it is for business owners to be aware of the macro environment and how changes may impact them. How important is it for businesses and their decision makers to understand what is on their radar, both from a micro and a macro point of view? Well, John, just looking at the business in isolation, that's not looking at the economy as a whole. When making business decisions, we're not allowed business owners to properly plan and navigate through uncertain times, just like we have now. Proper planning and a consideration of the macro environment allows business owners to better predict what their future trading conditions will be, and then hopefully be able to take advantage of any potential opportunities that may arise in the future. I'd like to welcome our next guest, Peter Lawrence. Welcome, Peter. Thanks, John. Peter, from my experience, middle market clients have common characteristics when it comes to attitude and mindset. I understand that this fact has been highlighted in the Future Partners Business Radar Report. Absolutely. The research showed us that the respondents preferred the terms private business or family business, and they shared consistent traits. So they're confident, they're bullish on their businesses and their, the industry that they're in, and they know what they're offering to the market and why. Regardless of the challenges and the changes that their businesses face, they are confident in navigating through those times, you know, the tough times, by being adaptable and also agile to be able to, be able to capitalise on the opportunities. They also share a growth mindset. So they're pushing the boundaries to grow and evolve their businesses. And they're usually self-driven. They feel a sense of control over what they're doing, how they do it, and you know, how that may change in the future. 
But from my perspective, you know, your comments and those results really resonate with me. What do you think makes business owners and leaders in the middle market unique? And how does their identity differ from small businesses and large multinational businesses? I think it's, uh, it revolves a lot around them being independent. So, so their businesses are big enough that they're financially stable. Uh, yeah, they've been in business a while, but they're young. I suppose they're not too big that they, they don't know everyone that's, that works with them, but they're not so small that they, I suppose, could, you know, survive in any sort of economic environment. But the research looks at four stages of a business, being startup, seed stage, growth, maturity, and transition. Were there any commonalities identified in the report? Yeah, so the, the qualitative research revealed there was a common loop in the business life cycle. So as businesses in, in the transition stage entered into a new growth state, then they went into a new successful business model. So this was evidence, though, we saw 40% of businesses in the transition stage have been in operation for less than five years, and 30% of businesses in the growth stage had been in operation for 10 years or more having looped through you know, prior stages and then they've started again. So the key factors that we saw that drove the, uh, the progression through the loop cycle were there's an additional investment into already successful parts of their business. They diversified in, into new opportunities to grow the business. And also there was an initiative identified that was seen to increase the profitability of the business. In your view, what kind of things should private and family business owners be looking out for in each stage of the business life cycle? So we've sort of noticed there's a bit of commonality with some of the earlier life cycles. So in, in the seed and growth stages, gaining access to new markets, finding sources of growth in the existing markets, and taking advantages of technological advances are sort of the key opportunities. They also oppose some of the biggest challenges for those stages as well, along with managing cash flow and obtaining capital. At the mature stage, we've sort of you know, only assumed to be looking for opportunities to increase their internal efficiencies. So Account and realise some um, reduction in costs. But they're also going to start to sort of notice the challenges for human resources trying to find new growth in their existing markets. And then when you get to the transitional stage, and then looking at you know, the challenges would be succession, finding new sources of growth as well, and managing cash flow as, as the industry gets more competitors and the, the competition increases. But the, the biggest opportunities for the, the transitional stage are leveraging digital marketing and technological advances and as well as you know, identifying opportunities to, to reduce costs as well. Peter, it's not uncommon for businesses to feel stagnant as they're going through various parts of you know, their, their business life cycle. What kind of things can businesses do if they are feeling stagnant in their current life cycle? Uh, so yeah, the biggest thing that we have realised through this research is that identifying and accessing new markets is probably something that can be done across all life cycles to help them get to the next stage. And that can be achieved through you know, introducing new services or products, you know, whether it's acquiring a new business or through innovation as well. And uh, we've obviously seen in the current environment that yeah, there's many stories of businesses that have adapted to be able to manufacture new products such as hand sanitizer. And yeah, but the, I suppose the best way we can look at that is to be the business owners to be opportunity ready. So if something crap comes up, you know, to be able to sort of you know, change their business and uh, adapt to that quite quickly. So obviously, innovation is a big way that they can do that, which is a bit of a buzzword, but it doesn't have to be something that's revolutionary or disruptive. So it can be just something as changing the way that the manufacturing process is done, so that you know, the product can be made cheaper uh, or quicker, and it may allow you to service customers that you currently don't don't service. So obviously a new process or you know, change in the process can have a wider commercial application, which you can white label and offer to new and existing customers. Without a doubt, innovation is important to the success of any business. To take us through the Picture Partners Business Radar Report findings when it comes to innovation, I've asked Kylie Lamprecht to join us. Welcome, Kylie. Oh, thanks, John. Kylie, can you take us through why innovation is important and what the report says about innovation? Sure. Look, I think ongoing innovation is absolutely critical to business success and business sustainability over time. Many of our respondents confirmed it to be front of mind, particularly as their businesses approach the maturity stage. I think it's really encouraging to see this appetite for growth and continuous improvement 
as it's led to many unique solution-driven processes, products and services from this segment of the market. However, despite this innovative approach to everyday problem solving, the report actually did indicate our middle market operators actually don't consider themselves innovators. So of our respondents who claim to be working in the business rather than working on the business, this can sometimes lead to a result in overlooking more transformative opportunities that could actually be commercialized. So in effect, they're inadvertently undervaluing the innovative solutions that they themselves have created. And it sounds like innovation isn't necessarily about becoming the next tech giant. Can you share some examples of ways your clients have innovated? Sure. Look, I think a common example that I've seen in our client base in recent times is where private businesses have invested in solving issues or embedding improvements in their own business. And then they realise that these innovations could have perhaps been really valuable to a broader range of businesses and that in turn turns into a new product line for them. So I've had things from uh, clients designing booking software for beauty services, which can be used in alternative health practices, or a telehealth approach with physiotherapy consultations. We've had design of physio equipment that can be used by other professionals to support well-being of all office workers, and even things like legal practitioners using tech to design a commercial contract review process. Look, I, I totally agree that innovation doesn't mean becoming the next tech giant, but in a lot of the cases I just mentioned that we've come across, it actually involves looking at technology and working out how it can be harnessed effectively to improve their existing and often very traditional business lines. I think technology with the smart processes applied well, it can drive more sales, efficiencies in the manufacturing or service delivery processes, or even just general efficiency across the business lines. I love to hear about clients who are looking at doing things differently. Often a challenge can become an opportunity for a business, and there are certainly plenty of examples at the moment uh, with the current environment that we have. We've seen distilleries producing hand sanitizer, we've seen clothing manufacturers producing face masks, we've seen other manufacturers that have gone from producing a product to uh, producing plastic face masks. What does the report tell us about challenges and opportunities? Look, I'm, I think while businesses in the mid-market are unique, a lot of their challenges are common, um, you know, including management of cash flow and attracting and retaining talent. However, many of these businesses are not really using data and analytics to their full capability, if at all. So I think there is a positive impact in just leveraging this information to further improve and grow their businesses in a sustainable way. The report acknowledges where the business might be exposed to threats, it encourages owners and operators to think of ways to address them, really to pinpoint if it's a, a knowledge problem or a skills problem, a resources or, or even a culture problem. We know each business in the mid-market is unique, but what are some of the approaches all business owners could use to address their challenges? Oh, look, I think for a business owner who is a founder or any business owner, it is really important to have an advisory board or an innovation committee to support the assessment and the filtering of those opportunities, including the, the timing of those opportunities. Irrespective of how the business owner is and at what stage of maturity in their business, a growth mindset over a fixed mindset will always attract the opportunities or at least make those opportunities visible to the curious mind. And Colin, what's your advice to business owners who spend considerable time and money on an opportunity that hasn't worked out? Obviously, there are a lot of lessons in those scenarios. What can we learn from them? Oh, look, I, I think as advisors, we, we also experience the journey of our clients. And often these trials and tribulations are quite personal to them. And from my perspective, the war stories are invaluable. Okay, so for some clients, there's often an emotional connection to an opportunity especially if it's been marketed as a social enterprise. So my number one would be never let success get to your head or failure get to your heart. 
failure or FAIL stands for first attempt in learning. So I think it helps to be philosophical. The opportunity won't define you as a business person, but it's how resilient you are in bouncing back and taking that building block into the next opportunity. And I think my third lesson learned is that you just have to know when to call it and walk away but ensure all the while you have strong sounding boards and effective communication with all stakeholders. I mean, really, as soon as it starts to put a strain on finances, family, friends, creditors and customers, you just have to ensure that the respective communications are clear. In the Picture Partners Business Radar Report, you'd be surprised to hear that we've also covered off on the emotional side of running a business. Many people might think this is strange since we're a bunch of accountants. However, I would like to introduce a man who's passionate about the emotion behind the numbers, Michael Dundas. Welcome, Michael. Thanks for having me, John. Why is it important for us to look at the emotional side of running a business? I think as business leaders, John, particularly in the current times, the challenges that we face as leaders are not the things that we got taught when we're going through our training and development. It's the challenges, the stresses, the mental pressures, uh, the sorts of decisions that we face. Often they're the things that make or break the effectiveness of our leadership. And so what we're finding with our clients, it's it's not the things that they got trained to do that's, that's defining the success of the business. It's the things that they haven't been trained to do. And it's how they carry their stress. It's how they lead their staff. It's how they manage unusual situations that can often drive the difference between a, a positive business outcome and a negative business outcome. And so it's important for us as picture partners to draw a lot closer to our to business owners, our client base, and to understand really where they're at, where, what's, what's keeping them awake at night, and really supporting them at that level is what's important to us. On that point, the most commonly referenced emotions from business owners and operators are frustration and uncertainty. Do you see this with some of the clients you work with and why do you think that's the case? Yeah, frustration and uncertainty is a common one and it's certainly one that we found the Business Radar Report to be quite insightful because often you'd put those two words down to things like frustration because there's no advocacy in the middle market or, or uncertainty because of economic times or, or changes in the marketplace. But in the report, we actually found there's a few other things going on in the middle market that's driving the frustration and uncertainty. There's a couple of comments in there around the difficulties that non-family members are facing in family businesses, which was an interesting insight. But overarching all of that was this sense that some business owners uh, had this sense of feeling of isolation, that when it comes to this issue of wrestling with complex decisions, new issues, new regulation, that didn't really have a peer-to-peer -peer network or an advisory base there that allowed them to talk through those problems. And so they're wrestling with a lot of things on their own, often feeling like they're the only person that's in their circumstances having to deal with the combination of issues that they're wrestling with. From our research, stress was largely down to cash flow management and human resource management. How can business leaders reduce their stress when it comes to these two topics in, in particular? Yeah, this is not an easy question, John, because they cause stress for a reason. They're both quite complex, aren't they? Uh, cash flow management is a, a multitude of different reasons why businesses will struggle with cash flow, whether it's the, the broadening of the terms of trade that we're seeing in the marketplace, whether it's you know, just tight margins making the business susceptible to, to changes in market conditions. They're all very, very tough. And I think the short answer is making sure that you have good advisory counsel or good tools around you. So... In cash flow management, over the last five years, for example, we've seen a big shift in the quality of tools available to really look into, into your business and find pressure points or opportunities or, or issues that could, could be used to improve your cash flow management. And in human resources, we're seeing an increasing want for businesses to outsource the advisory function given the, 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 the complexity around the regulations and given the challenges that they face in training staff to fit into their specific needs and their specific cultural requirements. You touched on sleepless nights, Michael. Sleepless nights were common across all business owners. However, the owners of the more mature stage businesses were the ones who slept best at night. And it makes sense, really, considering that they've been through the major challenges of setting up a business. 
This, of course, is a good thing, but do you think that this can sometimes allow business to be complacent and to also miss opportunities? Yeah, 100%. It is interesting, isn't it, that they say that the the mature businesses are the ones that are sleeping the best at night, but but equally, the business owners of a mature business, the survey shows they have the lowest level of drive and excitement about their business. And so we see in the survey, there's this big difference between the emotions and the strategies around the short term and the emotions and the strategies around the medium to long term. It seems to me that sleeping at night is really driven by the short term challenges and how how confident you are in where the business is at right now. But the wrestling with those, um, it's, it's the coal face means that a lot of businesses are not actually dealing with the medium to long term challenges. And we're seeing real gaps in the quality of risk management plans or the quality of succession plans and the amount of times in the survey we had uh, businesses telling us that they know that they have to deal with succession planning in the next three to five years, but they're just not getting to it. So yeah, I think it's great to see mature businesses get their business to a point that they can sleep at night because the day-to-day is working quite well or or they've got the systems to make the day-to-day work quite well but the real challenge for these businesses is to lift the eyes and to make sure they're still putting time aside to looking forward to three to five years and putting in the the plans and processes they didn't need to for the three to five year frame. You touched on professional loneliness earlier so you know the term professional loneliness was one of the key themes of the emotional side of running a business. Yeah, what does this mean and how can business leaders do to resolve the challenge of professional loneliness? Yeah, this one really resonated with me a lot, John. The concept that the report shows that we have a lot of business owners in the middle market that are grappling with complex issues but without support. They, they're stuck in that, in that they're not big business, so they don't necessarily have the big leadership teams around them that they can use as counsel. And so they're wrestling with a lot of challenges on their own and it's one of the biggest issues that they're facing it really stood out in the report that, that there's a real need for a shift for, for, for business owners and it's really costing them in that medium to long-term planning or the, the wrestling with complex issues. Coming out of it, I think there's a couple of things that business owners should be thinking about. Uh, the first one is peer-to-peer networking. If there's an ability for them to find ways to connect with people, uh, what I would say to business owners is I don't think it needs to be people in the same industry or people that, that, that have the same technical issues. Sometimes the value in business is just to talk. And to, to wrestle out loud with your challenges and wrestle with somebody else that gets where you're coming from, the process of talking can be one of the most effective ways of actually getting through some of the, the resolutions in your own mind. And then there's also the, the, the I guess, a growing emergence of advisory boards for, for middle market businesses, which is just a, the bringing together of two or three professionals from different sectors, whether it be an accounting advisor or a legal advisor or a HR advisor or, or even an IT advisor. And and bringing together a small group that meet regularly to help you as a business owner lift your eyes again from the day-to-day, to consider long-term strategic plans, and just to talk through challenges. I think these are going to be really, really important things for business leaders in the future. I agree, Michael, and I'm certainly a huge advocate for helping businesses resolve their feelings of professional loneliness and sleepless nights. And this is important more than ever as we navigate you know, the current environment with our, with our clients. From my perspective and from the conversations that I've had with our private business and family advisory partners around the country, being a professional sounding board is more important than ever. As you said, our role is more than just the numbers. Yeah, if I could share a story with you, John. When I first became a partner, I was handed a client. He was, he was 75 years of age at the time and was running a highly complex manufacturing business. And there was an advisory board function there that I inherited. It was actually my first advisory board that I was ever involved in. And, and we wrestled with a few issues over the course of the first couple of years. And then we got to a point where we had to have our engagement review where we tested what we were doing as a business. And we wanted to make sure that this particular client was happy with the work that we were doing. At the time, this guy was 35 years my senior. And I really had no technical understanding of his business at all. So I was really feeling that my contribution to this business was quite limited. And so I asked him, um, when we're looking at the review, are you happy with the advisory board? Are you getting out of this what you're after? And he turned to me and said, Michael, what you need to understand is that you're the only person that walks into my business that I can actually have a conversation with. And he said, I get that sometimes you don't know what I'm talking about, but you've got to understand it's the conversation that's actually giving me the benefit right now. And, and that for me was a profound moment. And I took that away with me as being the role that we can bring to situations like this. Is sometimes we won't have the answer, but sometimes we need to be there to help people have the conversation. 
it wouldn't be a true mid-market business report unless we covered off on family businesses. Those are either family owned but not operated by the family or family owned and operated by the family. And to help me explore that, I'd like to welcome Leon Mock to find out some of his perception based on the findings in, in the report. Well, th thanks for having me, John. Uh, great to be part of this. Um, great report that's been produced and looking forward to talking about it. Leon, are the specific complexities that family owned businesses may face? The thing you have to remember about family businesses is to always keep an open mind when advising them. Uh, they'll always have unique family and management dynamics and you have to be open to adapting your style to whatever best suits that particular client. Our findings reveal the difference in emotional association between family members and non-family members regarding access to appropriately skilled labour. Non-family members feel significantly more frustrated, whereby family members feel more secure and optimistic. What's your experience on, on this issue, Leon? Yeah, no uh, surprises with that finding. I find that many family businesses, the family tend to play their cards pretty close to their chest. They've usually built something from the sweat of their own brows and they're pretty passionate about it. So tend to hold their cards pretty closely. And this sometimes can lead to things like financial information and other important information about the plans for the business not getting through in the way it should to non-family members that may be tasked with working in the business. So it can be difficult for those individuals to be as effective as they want to be for that particular business. I think clear communication and transparency goes a long way, especially when that is the dynamic. And it often comes down to trust and ensuring that the entire management team work together in a very transparent and collaborative way. Leon, what's your advice to business owners that are having challenges with managing the dynamics between family and non-family members? John, I think, you know, this is something that we see quite often. And I think it's primarily about communication. Communication is the key to this. The dynamics within a family group and the business, like I said previously, very unique and will often evolve and sometimes quite quickly. Don't expect things to stay the same. Views will change. People that come into the business will change. So things are always evolving. And to cope with this, there has to be constant and clear communication between the individuals that manage the business. I think managing expectations is a large part of it and gaining an understanding and keeping tabs on what is invariably a changing game plan for the business is obviously very important. So communication is the key there. Leon, well, succession planning and the next generation is always a complex topic when it comes to family businesses. What if the next generation doesn't want to take over the family business? Broadly, you know, what are the options does a family business owner have in those circumstances? That's a great question, John. I think it's something that a lot of family-owned businesses are concerned about. I think one of the things that I always try and explore first is not necessarily accept the proposition that nobody wants to take it over, but seek really to understand why the, the next generation may not want to take it over. Often they don't feel they have the capability to, to do the job, which obviously is something that we, we can help with. And often it's the business is something that they would like to see evolve into something that they would be more interested and passionate about to take over. So I think testing that proposition first of why the next generation may not want to take over is a, is a very important first step. Obviously, there's a myriad of options if that route is closed. You know, everything from management buyouts to trade sales to mergers to listings and so on. So that's always open to a business. And that's always something that we have to be prepared to advise on and be talking to a client about. Often there is a misconception around succession planning being solely about exiting a business. But quite often it is more about being opportunity ready. From your experience and perspective, what does that mean? Oh, absolutely being about opportunity ready. It's so much more than just about talking about an exit from a business. It really is about planning the next sort of evolution of the business. And this doesn't always have to be an exit. It's about being in position to see and to take that next step about evolving the practice, whether it's bringing on the next generation into the practice, either from within the family, from outside the family or restructuring for growth or changing business conditions. It's all part of the process. I think the very essence of it and the key to it is really about engaging early, engaging about what the possibilities of, of eventualities in the future are and having that conversation together with your advisor about 
you know, what the possibilities for the future are. I think succession planning is such a wide spectrum of skills and conversation and disciplines that go into it, but early engagement is very much the key. From a policy perspective, the mid-market businesses are often overlooked when it comes to having a seat at the policy table. For example, only occasionally are they invited to consultative forums or to state and federal budget lockups to provide a view. But there's still a wealth of resources and incentives available to mid market businesses. What are your thoughts around you know, this issue? Look, firstly, I think it's very much in the DNA of Picture Partners to be an advocate and a champion for the mid market. I think it's something that everybody within this organisation is very passionate about. I think it's something to be very proud about working within this organisation. Engaging with us provides access to all the resources at our disposal in terms of assisting and advocating for a mid-market business. You know, my thoughts are the evolution of Picture Partners to be a champion and advocate for the mid-market is something that we should hold dear and continue to press into the future. It's great, Leon, and I agree that, you know, from a policy perspective, there needs to be a greater focus on mid-market businesses, and we certainly have a role there to play because they are truly the engine room of our economy. Thanks, everyone. This has been a great discussion and one I think a lot of privately owned and family business owners out there will find valuable. Through reports like the Picture Partners Business Radar, and these kinds of discussions, we have the opportunity to highlight that while every business is unique, business owners and leaders share the same challenges. If you'd like to discuss any of the specifics of the report or if today's discussion has sparked some new ideas you'd like to explore, please don't hesitate to contact a Picture Partners specialist.